Hello everyone, happy Friday, welcome to the regular stream. Looks like our audio levels were a little all over the place there today. We're, uh, we've rearranged the house over here at uh, the Grilled Cheese Sandies and Co. home. Hello, hello! Um, so you'll notice our background's a little different, we've shuffled where our regular setup is. Might be shifting around some of our settings, some of our things in the near future. But uh, yeah, hopping into just uh, a regular day here on Mars. Uh, talking about some upcoming things, probably reading chapter one here as well. Um, and we should also, I believe, be live over on YouTube. Um, though I don't really, I'm not, it's my first sort of dual stream. So if we do have YouTube comments coming in and I'm not seeing them, uh, my apologies. <laughs> uh, all right. So what do we do when we land on Mars? First thing for the day, we obviously claim our rations, do our jobs, do all those things. Find the red dots and click the buttons for the red dots. Claim a signet if you have a, a, uh, a skill over level 100. Obviously, want to do that every day. Hop on and uh, we're still, I think we're still working on drinking enough beer for the uh, event here. We need, yeah, we need to consume 50. And I, I mean, I've just conceded that I'm, I'm not going to get these done, so <laughs> I can't brew 250 of everything. I'm already renting out my tea shop pretty much constantly. Even at 10 per hour, people are still, like, slamming and renting. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know we're live on YouTube. I'm just not sure if we're seeing YouTube comments. <laughs> I'm not sure where to see them if they're coming in. Where to claim Signet if you are specialized. So that'll be in your action menu. It'll show up there in that list. Uh, we, of course, are doing Rusty Rigs, as we do on stream. And uh, if we ever win one of those uh, a Rig or a Rover Works, we always give those away. Uh, we need to use up just a tiny, a touch of stamina here to bring us back under 70 so we can eat. Uh, and then we run around and claim everything. Uh, that's what a regular day looks like for us, at least. Relatively quick gameplay. Like, if we're really in a rush, we can get all these major things done in, like, under, ah, like, under 15 minutes tops, I think. Uh, as we do a quick collect all. So I'll usually pop over here, make sure no one's applied to live in the settlement that I'd miss, and uh, hit the collect all, and usually that takes about a minute for our settlement. Good morning, hello, hi Kent, Deegan, Cell Power, Winnie, Tangemon, Lisa, hello, welcome, welcome. And we of course today are repping Million on Mars merch Fantastic cups. Hello, Nico. Welcome. How's everybody doing today? How's your Friday going? What are people up to? Hey, Sunny. Welcome on in. Um, yeah, we could. Well, we might need to do a little bit of work on uh, some of our like our angles and our things and and some lighting and stuff like. This, this new location is, is sort of interesting. We probably could do some background work. But uh, if Cricket is ever hanging out with us, we'd get to do a little quick turn. And uh, she'd be hanging out sort of here-ish, just uh, roughly in the background there. Her tower's just over there, so. All right, there you go. So we got about 1,000. I think we're, we're probably bringing in about 1,000 a day from uh, settlement rentals. Hey, Flyer, welcome, welcome. Flyker. Or is it Flykirk? No. Flyker. Flyker Condo. That's that's a name. Uh, okay. Let's keep keep on trucking. Running around. I have a question. If it's okay. No, no, no. Can't we answer every question? It's okay. Um. Any opinions on rocket fuel? Is it made in the sab reactor with a mi mixture of hydrogen, methane, and oxygen? So what I would do <laughs> is start Googling the different types of rocket fuel and then um, 
take a guess on which one you think might be implemented, and then chase down all of that. Mm -hmm. So I've done the same thing, um, and we could we could talk about it a little bit here. Um, see if I can't find a link, and we could dig into like. Uh, so there are real maps of where the thorium deposits are on Mars, right? And it has been talked about that, like, the location of your settlement or your plots will matter in the future. So, like, an easy one is solar panels would be more effective near the equator because you get more sunlight uh, more often. Or brighter sunlight. Um, Sot on SpaceX, they discussed using a sab reactor and methane. Ah, there you go, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you're fine. Gold scavenging tool. So I believe you're referring to a pack that you open, if I had to guess. Gold scavenging tool. Sounds like a scav like a master scavenging tool. Gold scavenging tool isn't specifically something. There's uh like a gold pack, I think. Gold Oh maybe there isn't even a gold scavenging pack? I don't think that's a thing. Maybe there is one on Atomic Hub. Hmm. Um, so we continue to run around, refill all the solar panels, claim everything that has uh, notifications so that we can fill everything back up. We always have plenty of batteries that need charging. Oh, something very exciting. Uh, so we just got to 100 scavenging. So this was training overnight and ready to go this morning. So that's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now our general, our skills are fabrication and scavenging are gold skills right now. Electrical is almost there. We just need like a few more papers for this. And we're trying to get everything else to about 60 for now. Um, with machining lagging behind a little bit. This is very difficult to train. Got a question. Account is created with wax, but I use Solana to buy a Martisan or something. Is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. So you just link both of your wallets on your, uh, on your profile there. You can link your wax, your Solana, your Matic, any of the addresses, and you can get them all linked there. It's also a good spot to come and claim any rental or uh, referral dusk. So this is where you earn uh, dusk on market transactions of people that you referred. And we do forget to come to this page every now and then. It's good to pop in there. Um, gold scavenging tool pack prepared in the machine shop. Sure. Yeah, let's go have a look. Sorry I'm late, we can start now. Welcome, welcome. Uh, not a, not apprentice tools. Gold tool packs. Ah, these guys. <laughs> yeah, and then I think you would go and open these in your inventory. Um, but I think these are wait wait to hear more on what exactly they're gonna do. I have guesses, but I don't have specific information for sure. Um, but my best guess with these is you open it, you receive a random rarity of tools um, with a, probably a regular percent breakdown. So 45% for common, 30% uh, uncommon, whatever that regular breakdown is for all the rarities. And it's not common, it's novice, apprentice, journeyman, that breakdown. Apprentice and up, there you go. Styles, Styles got it. Silver's regular. Oh yeah, silver's your regular one. Gold is a better breakdown percentages. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep wax as my primary. Yeah, you can change that yourself, investor. Um, and if it ever goes a little wonky, you can just email support and they'll switch which one's the primary. That's fine. Um, and this also implies that uh, you would be repairing your tools in the future. Yeah. 
with a random chance once your tools get broken to receive this. So this is just being reworked. It has it's not something that's live yet, but I mean it's a cool idea that instead of using tool charges, we'd move towards like having tools or not with a break chance or something. And then if they break, you need to repair them. I think it's pretty neat. But future stuff not currently implemented. And so we continue on our journey of charging all the power cells in the cheese oasis. Yeah, like rovers. Yeah, yeah, where rovers give you like a random uh, assortment of rover parts when you repair them. Uh, this would be something similar. You have a broken tool. You don't know, uh, regardless of which type it was, when it was broken, you get a random tool back when you repair it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so while we slowly make our way through all of our solar panels, because we do have a fair amount of them. Uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, I suppose, depending on who we've got here, and um, maybe we have new players, and uh, we try to talk about stuff for everybody here on stream, um... If you haven't tuned in before, my name is Grilled Cheese Sandies. Uh, we try to play a fair bit of just regular, this is what gameplay looks like uh, here on the stream. And we do like to do giveaways based on stuff that we open and do on stream. So if we ever get a win here on Rusty Rigs, we like to give away Rover Works and Mining Rigs here. Um, we try to give away some other stuff if we uh, roll some buildings. We've been rolling in the bazaar a little bit recently because those are always fun to give away. Guaranteed legendary building for somebody, always fun. How do we get the screen to change to the ch charge power cells? So uh, you need solar panels on a plot of land. So you will have had a land deed or a plot of land that you purchased. Um, you need to acquire a solar panel building, put the solar panel on it, and then you can click on uh, charge power cell. We're, we're doing uh, advanced, so charge power cell 2, which requires a higher level electrical, which is a whole other thing. Um, and then we're actually using Martisans, which is uh, over on the Solana chain. You can purchase Martisans, which are basically bonus stamina and they're their own people that train and learn skills and do things themselves we trained a whole squad of them to 25 electrical just to charge power cells for us but yeah the purpose of the friday stream is to answer player questions so like keep them coming if you have basic things and you want to learn and you want to know how the game works absolutely like that's what i'm here for happy to answer them <laughs> Hello, Cheese. Looks like I'm late. Hey, welcome, James. Sort of new. Over a little over a month. That's fine. Yeah, well, welcome. Ask your questions. We're, we're happy to answer them. How do I get points for the Access Badge Blend Tournament? Is that live? Is that tournament in here now? Access Badge Blend. Okay. So, we enter the tournament. It costs us 10 dusk to do so. Uh, so, we currently have zero points. There's a chance to win a Founder's Token. That's... And second place gets a Thorium Reactor... There's a thorium reactor here, a shard pack, gallery. Like, these are good prizes. Hmm. Is it a raffle or is it... It is a raffle. Okay. So this means everybody should be entering. Like, spend your 10 dusk, join this tournament. Even if you have one point, you have a chance to win. What about those legendary rover works? Yeah, we've gotten a few of those. Uh, what's up from the settlement? New Twitch account. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't have a land yet. How do I charge power cells and scavenging tools? Uh, so you can charge your scavenging tools over in the actions menu on the top left. This uses a full power cell and gives you 20 scavenging power. Um, you can charge your power cells by renting a, uh... So here, we'll, we'll send you rent, 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 rental. <laughs> what's, what's the command, people who have been here? Settlement? Settlement? 
Hmm. Or is that not going to Twitch chat? Anyway, you find your way to a settlement that has... Here, I mean, I can just manually click this, do this. There you go. So that'll link right to this settlement. Uh, so you head to a settlement. <clears throat> you find a... You find a um, plot with a little house on it, which means there's a habitat here, which means it could be available for rent to the public. Um, and then you find an empty solar panel like this one, and you can rent that solar panel to charge up your power cells without having to own the buildings yourself. What does a founder token do? Okay, so that's an easy one to talk about. So founder tokens... Um, get drops every Friday. Um, we're nearing the end of that, so it was a year worth of drops happening on Fridays. But I mean, I would guess that the last Friday would probably be like a little bit more of an interesting drop, like a special one. I mean, nothing confirmed or anything, just what I think. Um, hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Oh, so we didn't finish. Yeah, I guess they do more than just that. Um, you gain access to the Founders Chat in the Discord, uh, which is a focus group of people who all are very incredibly experienced players. Um, sometimes the devs uh, or the uh, s people, like high-level people in the company, will come and they'll chat in that Founder Chat. Um, you also gain... Uh, glitter when glitter comes out, so you'll get uh, 100 glitter every week. Yeah, I mean, I the access to that chat is like priceless. That's that's worth the cost alone. But even if you look at like the floor price of glitters, expectations, and where things are going, and I think it was like I think it's in the white paper where like. Glitter is supposed to come out, you get 100 every week, so you're going to get 5,200 5, glitter for the year worth of Founder Token Glitter Rewards, um, which was, I think, estimated at like 10 cents or something. I re Back when people were doing this value and doing the math on the Discord, you were getting $520 worth of glitter. So, I mean, any Founder Token under that price point is like just free stuff and access to the chat and still some rewards left on the year of drops initially. Anyway, um, basically all that to say, like, this is probably one of the best rewards you could get. <laughs> this prize. Okay, so how do we get points in this tournament? Um, so you would head over to uh, Nefty or Atomic Hub. You need to blend uh, badges over on those sites. So on Nefty under blends. <laughs> so Nefty, we go to blends. Uh, and within blends, we can turn in our access badges right here. Yep, yep, that's what we're talking about. Access blend, yep. Deposit, access badge, blend tickets. This is where you get them. So you blend your access badges together. We'll just drop this link for the people who are here. Uh, so this is where you go on Nefty, you turn these in, you uh, get a... So for example, we did this when we turned 25 uh, access badges into this purple ticket. Then we come back over here, we come to our inventory and when we deposit this access blend ticket, uh, we can trade this in. So access badges, anyone who held founder tokens for a really long time was getting dropped access badges every single month. Um, and otherwise you could buy them on the secondary market. And at the time when the tournament came out, I believe access badges were maybe 50 to 75 cents. Currently, I think they're about $2.
Um, how much does a founder token cost at the moment? I believe around 250 US. Still, like, incredibly underpriced from... Uh, lowest. There you go, 225. There's only, there's six under 250. So, yeah, so we get these access blend tickets. Uh, you can even, like, even just one to put your name in because it's a raffle. Um, you deposit them and your score goes up and then based on the score, somebody, someone will be selected as a winner. Uh, so what, uh, what does that look like? So if there's somebody with a thousand and there's someone with a hundred, uh, this person has about 10 times the chance of winning as this person. Um, so you add up all of the score and then you pick one out of all of those. And if your number comes up, then you win. Hey, Jeff, welcome, welcome. Everyone should also join the SFL Sunflower Land, uh, returned... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Join this tournament, even if you're not competing super hard. Uh, your door prize of, like, some scavenging tools, all this stuff, like, this is worth it just for the one sunflower entry cost. Friday already. Yes, indeed. Tell us, yeah, good, uh-huh, uh-huh. Should a screen come up when I left-click on the plot with the house symbol, nothing happens. Yes. Um... If you click on this, this plot details screen should pop up on the right hand side. So even if it's not your plot, like if I click over here, this is owned by somebody else, but should still be able to rent buildings on that plot. Like these are available for rent, so I could do tasks in here. Um, yeah, okay, so that's how the blend tournament works. Uh, if I wanted to get points in that tournament, I could deposit uh, this access blend ticket and my points would go up. Uh, but as this raffle is repeating eight times, I believe that this first tournament Available now ends in 20 days. A long... Okay, so these are like once every three weeks. Um, but I believe this first one will have the heaviest participation as everyone jumps in, everyone throws in all their tickets. And then I think I'm going to hold mine for some later weeks when I think chances of winning a raffle are better because just a little bit less uh, total entries. That's my plan anyway. Yeah, welcome Jeff, Iceman, Ruler, welcome on in. Uh, we weren't quite done running around all of our plots and picking everything up that was here. Uh, we might actually run out of empty power cells. One of the things I need to get better at, and hopefully Martisans can fix this in the future, is uh, filling all of the buildings with power. So, we have lots of full power cells. We just need to be better at... Ah, there we go. <laughs> it's, uh... We can't claim Dusk from this because it's not ours anymore. <laughs> not getting the information after clicking on a plot. So, you could try refreshing... Still sad after the habitat nerf, less and less buildings to make dusk. Well, there's, there is like significant amounts of dusk out there. Um, we don't need that many buildings printing more dusk. We, I think, I mean, I'm not the, the guy behind the curtain running the economy and I'm, uh, you know, just a lowly opinion, but I don't think we need more stuff that, uh, is printing dusk out into the world. Uh, there's plenty of it in circulation, like, let it go around. <laughs> how to claim dusk on artifacts. That's, that's how you do it. Um, you click on the artifact, you click claim dusk, and you click that button. Uh, but we, we sold our artifact. 
So that's uh, not our thing. Not our button to claim anymore. How come that artifact is still in your plot? So this stays here until the person who we sold it to places it on their plot. Um, do we think we'll put Martisans on wax? No. Uh, they were advertised as a Solana exclusive. That's where they are. Uh, and that's where they're hosted. Um, we're just running around here and doing some shred copper tasks because those are pretty good for machining experience. And uh, machining is the skill that we're lacking. If you are looking to train your machining, um, even from level 5, you have access to this task. And this is pretty good all the way up to 50. Um, our problem here is that we lack enough engineering bays. They're going to add more Martisans to buy in-game. Likely. Um, because there's a, a pretty big stock of Martisans, right? That There's 10,000 total, and there was so many sold in the first sale, and... There was some held for like prizes and stuff in the wallet, and they've already done some of those giveaways. They did the celebrity giveaways. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, definitely still more that could be sold, right? So, um, oh, we sold it to Eric. Eric picked it up. Uh, all right, let's keep, keep on keeping on. Hello, Undisputed Noobs. Welcome, welcome. Any tips for upgrading fabrication? Yeah, okay, so if we wanted to train our fabrication um, from an early level, I think you want to be doing the crafting wires task. Yeah, so a straight eight fabrication XP. So this is okay to start you off. Um, and then I think you want to... Sh no, the shredding, these are machining tasks at the bottom. Um, fabrication XP, I think, is going to be mostly in a 3D printer after that. So it's going to be lots of these tasks. I know bamboo furniture was pretty good for a while there. This requires 25, though. Um, probably making tools would be my guess. That requires 30. Novice tool? Yeah, making novice tools is going to be a, a really good bet. Novice fabrication tools? Yeah, look at that. Crazy amounts of experience. Really, really good. Um, so you could do the same. You could also go to uh, Gen 3 CADs will build up um, hazards that need to be repaired that give you fabrication experience when you fix those. So if you can invest in a Gen 3 CAD, uh, you get a really good repair task that you can do pretty regularly on it. I'll see if I can find one and show what we're talking about here as well. Uh, I think we have one here. So this hazard will build up structural decay, and when you go to repair it, it requires no fabrication level, and it gives XP for all the hazard that you're uh, removing from the building. And this just costs you like a little bit of power and metal bits. It's relatively cheap experience, and it's instant as well. It just builds up itself over time. And when you get to higher levels, fabrication level 10, and you really let this build up, huge, huge fabrication experience gains. Can't find my missing training token. Can you help me find it? Uh, have you clicked here in your inbox? Likely, this is where it probably has landed. Uh, if you're somebody who uh, rents training halls and then somebody in the settlement claims it for you, that's where it would land. If it hasn't landed there, you may have to go through support and ask them for your training token back, and then they'll do some digging and try and find it for you. Gen 3 CAD thing still works. Is it worth it at level 40 fab? No. Um, it no longer works for high, high level players, because uh, I don't think it can build up enough uh, structural decay to even be able to do this highest... Like, we can't build up to 500, because that's more than 175%, even when this gets turned on. Yeah, I I mean, I liked infinite <laughs> infinite hazard buildup, but I know some of the it was not well liked by most people. <laughs> what do we think about giving away two packs of five hundred fab XP? Just send the winner my way. Yeah, I mean we could do that. You have uh, you have ways to get it to them. Oh, is my pen dead? Fab XP. <coughs> Excuse me. Plot full of CADs. Ah, there you go. 
yeah, we can send people your way. <clears throat> I think one of the things we're going to do is a legendary building giveaway because we're nearing the end of being able to do that. So want to do some of those while we still can. Uh, we're right, Oh, there's someone who can do some stuff. How do I find a piece of land in game with three words? Uh, so there isn't really a way to do that. N not that I'm aware of. Uh, am I? Oh, if you know the DTM that it's on, then it might be possible. <clears throat> So this chunk of the address at the top is going to be the same. Do you drink coffee with cheese? No. Just coffee. So to find the plot in game, you also need the um, DTM that is uh, it is on. And this is going to be the same. So if you know it's on MC9, the rest of this is all going to look the same. And then you would just type the three words here at the end. Can I give out an expert scavenging tool? No, I cannot. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we could open a pack and try and open one, and if we hit one, then we could give one away. Mm -hmm. I would say if we hit exactly one, um, not mint lowest, price lowest. Uh, packs scavenging tool pack here you go so if we hit exactly a uh, expert scavenging tool we'll give away an expert scavenging tool if we hit anything else though we're gonna keep it <laughs> all right let's open you open you yes all right <laughs> here we go if we get exactly expert scavenging tool we'll give it away but uh, anything else uh, we're just going to have to keep it ourselves here ah okay not a scavenging tool <laughs> um more chapter reads yeah we're going to start doing chapter readings here on this channel as well uh, ask about finding lanes because I'm on Atomic Hub looking at plots under space available. Some have no space, some have a hundred. Should I assume that land has buildings on it or is that number just random? Uh, nope, so land always has the same amount of space. So like common Gen 2 plots will have 50 space on them. Uh, like this. And uh, available space will say how much is left. If there are buildings taken up, available space will be zero, and it should list all the buildings and their rarities and whatnot on it as well. Rusty rigs? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we could press this thing. That's fine. Uh, reading chapters here? Yes, absolutely. Um, we could probably get that going sometime soon. We just need to finish putting everyone to work here. One of these days we'll hit Rusty Rigs and it will be a great time and we'll give away so much stuff. Yeah, yeah, if you can find a plot that has buildings on it. Like, I saw a pretty cheap, I think it was $4.50, uh, common Gen 2 plot. Uh, so all the space was gone, but it was two rare sabs on it, which are like way more expensive. So two rare sabs for free is a, a great deal. <laughs> we want the ice now. I guess ice and regolith are uh, starting to go up in price too, hey? Uh, okay, so before we go to this last plot to charge everything, we need to feed all the Martisans. To feed all the Martisans, we're going to have to buy some more food, though. So we need to find the food, buy like 10,000 food, uh, because the Martisans uh, eat a lot of food. And we'll get a good chunk back because we just overpaid. Um, this one has greenhouse, solar panel, uh, 
Greenhouse common, solar panel uncommon, solar panel rare. That's a great deal. So if you're looking to buy your first land on Mars, um, one of the highest recommendations I can give is to pick up a land that has some solar panels on it already. That's going to jumpstart your gameplay. Oh, right. We need to actually feed everyone in order to do this. Um, yeah, find a, find a plot that has some solar panels on it. And, uh, yeah, you'll be good to go. Ready to, ready to take off. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna take a stab. We're gonna read chapter one here today. Um, I think I've talked about it on stream before, but, uh, in my sort of day-to-day -day life, I, I do a fair bit of speaking um, and reading and things like that just to keep my voice up because talking constantly and and keeping up a decent cadence and everything, like it, your vocal cords, your voice will get sore and tired if you're not someone who talks all the time and practices talking all the time. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I do, I read to my wife every night before bed um, we'll work our way through different books and stuff. And, uh, I also teach. So I, I teach, uh, I train lifeguards, um, and I teach first aid and things like that. And so speaking in front of those groups regularly and constantly also helps. <clears throat> yeah, because, uh, it's, it's a skill and <laughs> people don't think of it until you try and get up and talk in front of people for like eight hours in a row for a course and then you realize that you haven't talked constantly because you you know for a regular cadence of a conversation with your friends you you have breaks and other people take turns and you're not the only one talking constantly for the entire thing baywatch cheese yeah i, I am my main job title is lifeguard <laughs> yeah um, I do, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing, and I'm happy to talk about it for the people who hang out with me outside of, uh, Mars and, and come join the Cheese Oasis and want to hear about that kind of stuff, but I don't talk too much about my life on stream. I mostly focus on Mars, but, you know, I'm still a person. <laughs> I still have a life, and I do things, and I exist. Nothing that cigarettes and gasoline won't solve. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, just have a few more here to, to get these panels going. Hi, die rolls. Welcome, welcome. We're just getting the last few Martisans put to work here, and then we're going to hop into Chapter 1 and give it a read through. We'll make sure we take a timestamp so that we can uh, cut the clip and cut out just chapter one for the people that want to be listening to the chapters separately as well. Um, how far along has everyone read? Is this anyone's first time actually hearing uh, chapter one? It's been such a long time that they've been out. I, I would think that most people have read them by now, but I'm I, obviously that's not the case. I'm sure there's some people who haven't. What level of solar panel do I need to get a discount on stamina? Very high level. Uh, so the max level for your panel. So uh, power cell three, yeah. So even this level four epic panel doesn't get the stamina discount until it gets to level five. If we upgrade this one more time, then we get a discount on this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Claim your chapters. I mean, we, we probably would have seen it when we hopped into, um, hopped in to start reading, but yeah, definitely claim your chapters. And if you're someone who owns all of the chapters, oh, we ran out of power cells. Um, if you own all of the chapters, you'll have a button at the very top that allows you to claim all. Uh, we, oh, we do not own chapter 12. So we do not have that button. We should probably go buy chapter 12 though. Uh, chapters, chapters, chapter 12, uh, yes, okay, we have enough here, that, that works for me, give me chapter 12, one research paper, yes, excellent, 
Is there an easy way to check if a few lands are side by side so we can build a settlement later on on Atomic Hub? Um, not an easy way, but there is a way to search specifically for... Oh, I don't have the link anymore. So there is a way to search for lands that are in the same DTM. Um, but uh, I, I'd have to go digging for the way to do that. Uh, I'd have to follow up later. Um, yeah. Let's finish. Okay, so we need to throw some power into some stuff to free up some empty power cells. So let's start like filling all of our mining rigs. Um, filling our rover works. Those guys are important. Uh, we could definitely be filling smelters. We use all the power in all of our smelters all the time. Uh, the engineering bay, if it has... Yeah, okay, a little bit in here. Yeah, definitely want to make sure we're filling everything with power. Freeing up some empty power cells. Yeah, that is how it goes. What do we mean by chapter one? Is this a landowner thing? So there is a building, it is called the library. Uh, once you have a library, you have access to so much stuff. Um, so one of the things, for example, you need a library in order to train your skills because you need to do research and produce research papers and use those to train your skills. Another thing that is hosted in the library is, uh, the novel with all of its chapters. Um, so the novel is written by CEO Carrie Waters. Um, you can buy chapters as they come out, and uh, there is now a button at the top, so for each chapter that you own, you can claim one research paper per day, per chapter. The first time you read a chapter, so that was for acquiring chapter 12, you'll get 150 dusk as well. Um, so what we're saying here is we're going to read chapter 1 for everyone on stream. Uh, we were just freeing up a couple power cells here to do our last few Martisons into these solar panels, and then we're going to hop over and do that. Most expensive book I have ever bought. Is it? <laughs> Didn't buy any time to buy some. Selling shards is a full-time job. Ah, yes. Well, the flip side being that it's the only book that you've bought that also has utility other than being a book, right? <laughs> you're, you're probably not accounting for the 150 dusk you got back per chapter that you got, and the research paper that you're getting every single day, which is worth another 7 or 8 dusk right now. Yeah, the book with the most utility out there. I suppose we're um, probably going to need to mute our music here. If we're going to read the chapter. Research papers are down. Oh, good. Good. I like that. I buy a lot of research papers. So, because these, oh man, we, we sink so many research papers into uh, researches. First book that is released chapter by chapter. Maybe? I'm sure if I did some digging, I could find another one, but it's a good book. Recommend it. Go buy like 10K papers. Yeah, okay. We'll buy some research papers. No, see, did, who said who said four or five? Like, no way. If I could get research papers for four dusk, I would buy 10,000 of them. <laughs> oh, man. But if anyone needs uh, apprentice fabrication research, let me know. I got a good stockpile of that built up. How much is a library uh, seven? How much is a library seven? Library seven is a, that's a really high level uh, thing. Ah, uh, ah, hello. <laughs> I 
Price spiked up since last night. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Get me all excited for cheap research papers. They don't exist. All right. Uh, let's let's get over here. Let's start doing the thing. Where are we? Uh, 46. 46 minutes into the stream. Ah, uh, 40, call it 47. We're reading chapter one right now, yeah. Maybe blowing this up a little bit so it's a little easier to read because I am a blind man. Put your buy order in for four dusk of paper. Maybe it'll happen eventually. Yeah, but I don't have 40,000 dust kicking around. <coughs> All right. Chapter one, Jesse. September 2069. Jesse was goggled in at work when the message came in from Marisol. He was deep in finish deep in Finnish work for a new housing development near Jazztown. He was finally finding the groove with the new foam insulating core material, laying a thin sheet of colored glass over the top that, as it cured, was creating a smooth, insulated, crack-proof kitchen counter. The color was coming out a bit pink. More ink cap in the mix. He gestured to the upper right with his index finger and made a swirl motion in the air. And in the scene, he saw the counter adjust to a more tasteful terracotta. He stood up, stretched, and flicked on Mar's message. She was smiling, and inside her new apartment. She always looked good in that green sweater. Okay, this is an immersive experience. I might have put in some haptics. Go sit in the lounger outside your door. She was always doing thoughtful stuff like this. No doubt this present would be tasteful and well-chosen. He had no idea what this one was even for. As he opened the door to the back patio, it squeaked and rattled the whole house. And when he shut it behind him, the windows made an alarming racket. Stick-built houses don't just fall down, he reminded himself. Still, it was time to shimmy into the crawl space and see just how bad the old joists looked on the sill. His dad had recently admitted to a long-time dishwasher leak that had caused him to stop using the appliance for some time prior to Jesse moving back in. At least, that was the excuse for the piles of filthy dishes in the sink and along the counter. On the patio, he cleared off the leaves and brushed the dirt from one of the loungers. It was old Hollywood material, somehow spongy to the touch despite its alleged lifetime preparation for the elements. The chair just reminded him so much of his mom that he'd never be able to part with it. He sank slowly into it, willing himself not to accidentally break off an arm or something. As soon as he did, he regretted that he hadn't spent more, a few more minutes tidying the area first. He could smell an ashtray nearby, probably on the rotting picnic table, and there were empty beer bottles strewn about. The wind howled through the wall of the meta shield that rose from the back edge of the yard up over his head in the dark. A slight shimmer from the material dimly reflected some of the moonlight as it flapped in the wind like a giant tent. It was in transparent mode, passing the breeze straight through the tiny open pores of the fabric, and that was causing some percentage of the beer bottles to catch the breeze at the right angle to whistle a joyless tune for the hungover. Afraid the lounger might not survive him hefting his weight out of it and back in again, at least on this damp night, Jesse opted to tap the side of the goggles he was still wearing, switch to house mode, and turn up the environmental controls on the Metis shield. The wind died down and air quality registered nominal. He amplified the moonlight, casting a reassuring gentle glow across the backyard. Separating it from the dark forest beyond the Metis bubble, he switched back to Marisol. Okay, you're there? Okay, I've set up the whole thing here, so we can have a date night together. Ish. Hang on, I need your Metis. A pop-up menu. Allow access to Metis Shield? What the heck? Okay. There, how's that? The backyard was lit now by a brilliant sunset on the fabric dome that he was staring at. Inside his goggles, he had a VR Marisol to his left, who was holding a package and sitting in a chair right next to him. They were in her apartment, and he was looking out her window over her balcony. At the same sunset, she'd managed to merge to his Metashield dome perspective. It must have taken her hours to construct. I can't get over the, the blue sunsets. Look at this, Jesse. Isn't it astonishing? I don't think any of the ads managed to do it justice. 
Anyhow, a anyway, now that you... <laughs> anyway, now that I have you almost here, I want to give you an early birthday present. I mean, you'll have to collect it in person when you get here, but I couldn't wait to show it to you. Here. Her voice was a little tentative, and she looked like she was happy but concentrating heavily. Slowly, she held the package out in front of her and managed to deposit it right on his lap. Jesse felt a convincing couple pounds of weight when she did. Through the goggles, he admired the object that appeared in his lap, pulling gently at the bow on top of the wrapped package. It untied with a flourish, like a ribbon in a Disney princess's hair, and the paper around it unfolded with a crinkling sound, and the ribbon disappeared in a poof of confetti. <clears throat> Jesse was looking at a beautifully rendered hand plane, a woodworking tool, <clears throat> like a set he had in his garage. It's a plane. I mean, I know you know what it is. I just wanted you to I just want you to know you have one here now for our soon to be garage workshop. I was down in the crafts district today and it turns out there are some new bamboo laminates that sand like old growth hardwood. They don't have the beautiful wood grains, but I'm excited I'm so excited to see what you'll build here. I love you, Jesse. Awkwardly, Marisol's image remained frozen with her smile at the I love you, Jesse, and her staring at some middle distance. No one could ever work out the interpersonal dynamics and eye lines and so on when making full, a full AR message, which is why they'd never really caught on for day-to-day -day communication. Jesse studied the plane for a while. It was classic Marisol. Tastefully chosen, serviceable, not too showy. He loved her, and he loved that she thought so much about him. He tried to squelch the unpleasant thought that he could never, ever imagine handling it in person in some kind of closed habitat on Mars, pretending some new composite material worked like real hardwood. He ripped off the goggles and stood up, saying, House control, meta shield transparent mode, please, about as loud as Danny's whoops in response to any action on Mars Ball, which is to say, too loud. His heart was racing, thinking about being outside on the Martian surface. He didn't know why he always pictured being outside, freezing, unable to breathe the CO2 heavy air mixture, panicking and smothering. It horrified him. It freaked him out that people made decisions to move there like they did about going to Disneyland, except it was more like signing up to live on a submarine that could never surface again. It was dark again, but there was a reassuring sound of an owl outside the Metis, and he, bus he busied himself picking up bottles and cigarette butts filling the cans on the side of the house. There were cardboard boxes overflowing with empty bottles and food garbage next to the cans. Monday night. Thanks, Dad. Trying not to think too much about rats, Jesse compacted the big wheeled carts and pulled them around to the garage and down the long driveway to the street for collection in the morning. On a roll, Jesse opened the side door of the garage to the little utility closet his dad had abandoned years ago, where a tidy collection of tools resided. He grabbed the utility broom and dustpan and swept the whole patio, picking up leftover bits of glass, leaves, a few napkins, and god knows what else, and tossed it all in the last bin. He stepped back into his room from the squeaky back door and went across to his bathroom, which was bright and antiseptic clean. His few toiletries were arranged neatly next to the sink, and a small pile of white towels were folded on a shelf above that. After he first washed his hands thoroughly, he then washed and dried his face with one of the towels before tossing it in the hamper. Time for dinner. He should check on his dad. Jesse crossed the threshold from his room into the greater house, which required a bit of psychological prep every time. It still smelled dirty, despite the cleaning he had been doing every day for a week since his arrival. Danny had always been a bit cluttered and haphazard in his housekeeping, but in the past few years that had escalated to something diagnosable. Yanaris had left a basket of fresh vegetables from the garden outside. She had been maintaining it in exchange for a share of the crops since Jesse and Marisol were young. Just a few years ago, it had dawned on Jesse that perhaps she didn't want to supplement her job managing the boutique wine, bu boutique wine making operation next door with a little substance farming. Uh, perhaps she had a bit of compassion for her kid daughter's aid for a kid her daughter's age whose parents weren't really together enough to keep a hot dinner on the table every night. Jesse had thrown away the many weeks' worth of baskets that were starting to rot in the entryway. With this fresh batch, he sorted a few bell peppers, eggplants, and squashes, and began slicing them with the mandolin. 
Combined with the tomato sauce he was simmering on the stove with oregano, basil, and garlic, he was making one of Danny's favorites, Angela's ratatouille. He had been making it with his mom since he was in elementary school. Danny would eat this, even though it seemed he didn't eat much else these days. He mostly just drank. While the kitchen was busy filling with good smells, Jesse went and knocked on his dad's bedroom door. Dad, dinner time, Jesse said through the door, quickly moving on to grab a stack of paperbacks piled up on the billiards table that filled the area where the sofa should be. There's a trash bag duct taped around a pipe extending from the ceiling over the center of the table. Danny had decided to remove the wood stove it was attached to because priorities. The paperbacks had all been stored on the bookshelves along the wall, but at some point rodents had gotten in and nibbled the pages, fouling most of the Lebu library with droppings and urine. He avoided emptying the bottom shelves just yet, which held the hardcover children's books his mom used to read to him. He quickly leafed through the pages of a glossy volume of stained glass projects, looking for hidden treasures inside. No joy this time. The big book from AA had some postage stamps with zeppelins on them, dating from the 1930s. Danny thought they were worth money and was delighted to run across them again. Jesse had tried to sell them, hoping for enough to cover a new siding, but because of the poor condition, they only brought in enough for takeout dinner that night. This was just junk, acquired thoughtlessly, left to rot in this rotting house. Jesse dropped the book in the oversized kitchen trash can he had placed in the middle of the room before returning to stir the tomato sauce again, a little bit at a time. This was the best way to get rid of stuff without upsetting his dad. Jesse sliced the baguette and slathered the slices with oil and salt on a tray before sliding it into the oven. Dad? It was too quiet. Concerned, Jesse hustled across the room to the bedroom door again and knocked. Dad? A beat too long. Then the door opened. What? Ah, okay, give me a sec to get decent. Smells good out here. Jesse turned away and busied himself with more piles of trash. We take a little break. There's a, there's a little thing. I think that, that, that says, take a break. <laughs> Put your bio, uh, trying to sell some stuff. Uh huh. She's ASMR stories coming soon. <laughs> break time uh that says chow and then a bunch of things that i don't speak that language how about a giveaway for break yeah we could do that we'll come back to this point um Yeah, read in little sections. <clears throat> we could set up a little giveaway for people. Um, let's see, how are we doing for, oh, let's reset this, there we go. What does reading the chapter do? Uh, do you mean like us reading it aloud? <laughs> Gives you leaks about the game, yeah. So, for example, in this first chapter, we are now talking about a large number of things, right? We've talked about the meta shield that's around the house. Uh, we've talked about, uh, like, what it does and how it's there. <clears throat> At the time of the release of that chapter, meta shield didn't even exist in the game. I think you could find metas by scavenging at the time. <clears throat> Um, but staying on top of the latest chapters gives you insight into what's coming. So you could like at the time, the price of Metis that you people were getting from scavenging was maybe like 0.1 or like dirt cheap. Cause nobody knew what it did. It didn't do anything. And then Metis shield came out and it had purpose and Metis was used in a whole ton of things. And people who were reading the story knew that that was coming and invested in it beforehand. Um, I was just checking how many credits we have and if we could do a building giveaway. Yeah, we have basically zero and we would need to buy about, uh, I assume a full 800 because we have no shards of anything. Yeah, okay. So we need, we need about 800 shards and we'll do a little building giveaway here. Uh, let's buy this for 1.4. 
and we'll roll a building to give away here. I wouldn't be offended if I won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can turn back on our music here for a little bit. And yeah, so when we put this out on the uh, YouTube channel later, we will... Um, We'll be sure to timestamp when things are happening so you could jump and listen to the full story if that's what you want to do. Uh, we're looking for this and this and this and that. <laughs> so we just have to roll 100 credits here and then we'll roll, roll a legendary building. We'll add that to the giveaway. Um, um, hmm, hmm, hmm. um, so also reading the story gives you insight into the different characters and sort of their strengths and things. Also, some interesting sort of side lore, right? So for anyone who wasn't aware, like, there is a game that is played on Mars. Did anybody catch it? Does anyone, anyone know? That it was mentioned in that read through. They do play at least one sport on Mars. Mars ball! Yeah, so we play Mars ball. <laughs> like, there's some depth there. No idea what you're doing. Did you turn in shards? Yes, okay, so we buy a whole bunch of legendary shards. And then in the shop, we're able to go down here and we can turn those shards into bizarre credits. Um, so for every eight uh, CAD shards, we get one, uh, or, or any type of shards, we get one bizarre coin. So we take those over to our bazaar and we roll them in the bazaar. So they have a chance to give us more uh, so this didn't do it. So those are all, those are all failed rolls, which is what we want anyway. So it's not a big deal. But when you do this, they have a chance to give you more uh, shards than you put into them. And we're, we're going a little too fast. It doesn't like that. <laughs> um, what did it cost? About twelve hundred dusk. 1,200 dusk for us to do one of what we're doing right now. Um, but we get a legendary building out of it. Yeah, but we, we're basically buying a legendary building. Um, <clears throat> probably losing money in the process because we probably could have gotten the legendary building cheaper than what we're paying right now. Sorry, our music might be a touch loud there. 880 legendary shards is one legendary building, and each shard costs this to this. Yep. But uh, we'll get to roll for a legendary building at the end of this. And you have a chance to acquire a mining rig or a rover works or a solar panel. So a chance to get a really good legendary building. But lots of the time you'll get a building that was probably cheaper to just buy itself. Um, but the fun thing on stream today is if we don't hit the So if we hit the really really rare buildings, um, I'll be keeping them because I, I need them But if we hit anything else Which is like 93% of the time, uh, we'll give that building away Mm-hmm mm -hmm. Then we'll jump in back into some more reading as well. There's just a lot of... Chapter 1 is a, a hefty chapter. There's a lot to read through. <clears throat> Need a legendary Roverworks? You keep missing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's only like 1% of the time. To enter giveaways, you type waffle. <laughs> waffle? Yeah. Raffle when it comes up. Waffle if you want to be a jokester. Oh. 
84. This should give us 10 more. Yep. So we just need six of these to hit. Tea with honey can help with a sore throat from reading. <clears throat> I mean, practice as well. That's what we need the most. I just need to be reading more than I do now. I would say right now we're reading like every other night and we're probably only doing a couple chapters. Um, but I, I don't usually get a sore throat from it. I just get, uh, I mean, burnout's not the right word. Like I, I get, um, a bit of a cough. I don't know how, <laughs> build up maybe. I don't know. It's tough to keep going. That's all. All right. We will roll a building for a giveaway today. If we hit a rig or a rover works or a uh, solar panel, we'll be keeping that for ourselves. But that's only 3.6% of the time. So 90, 96.4% of the time, uh, we'll be giving this building away to somebody in the chat. 3.6% of the time, we'll be keeping it for ourselves. All right. But we, we would like the Roverworks. Yeah, I, I would ha I'd love a Roverworks or a solar panel or a, a rig for ourselves. But 96% of the time, we're giving some, a legendary building away for somebody here. Uh, but we'd love a Roverworks for ourselves. I'm okay with those odds. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Legendary greenhouse for somebody in the chat. Legendary Gen 2 Greenhouse. There you go. Yeah, we'll add that to the giveaway at the end of the stream here. Got space for a legendary building? I, I guess I could fit it in. That'll do. Uh, okay. We're about... Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, zoom in a little bit here. There we are. All right, we're going to get reading again here. We're about, about a third of the way through. Yeah, it was Machine Shop last week. You're right. Pause our music here and note what time we're starting. 109.30 and get going again. <clears throat> the joists were definitely rotten. The kitchen cabinets had to go and the framing needed to be replaced down to the sill. Jesse was filling some large trash cans again and periodically taking them out to empty in the dumpster in the driveway. He had started with the contents of the cabinets mismatched cheap grocery store pans from middle-aged ladies who had an initial flush of fondness for Danny, frying pans with burnt-on food and maybe not food, cracked plastic cups from fast food drive throughs Then he took a breaker bar to the cabinets. They were cheap laminate over chipboard held together by glue, illegal manufacturing for at least 20 years. Jesse was fortunate that they had a demo exemption from a, for a pre-2030 structure. At least the recycling and dump fees weren't going to bankrupt him. Once he got the drawers and doors out, he could feel how spongy the floor felt underneath. Danny had been right about the dishwasher leak. It looked like a rat had chewed through the drain line in the wall a long time before Danny stopped using the appliance. And now there was a thick layer of black mold on the wall. Jesse rifled through his portable tool bag to find an N95 respirator and fastened it tight over his mouth and nose. He put on safety goggles and went back to demo. Ignoring the train of his own thoughts as much as possible, he just threw his body against sheetrock, plywood, and rot, and with the help of a sawzall and breaker bar, until all the rot was out. Then he started sweeping and cleaning until he could see what was left of the kitchen. Nothing, down to the studs. Some of the plumbing looked like it needed service, and even the electrical wiring was fraying. Was frayed. Jesse projected a zipline menu onto the wall from his wrist. He selected a simple butcher block table with steel legs, tube steel made locally, 
and a butcher block from local New Growth Redwood. Delivered Tuesday. Ugh. Point two glitter. New cabinets, appliances, a hood, and all that was going to cost at least a full G, maybe two. It was almost five G into this new thing now into this whole thing now, nearly a full down payment on a house. Jesse was starting to feel panic about money again. His family never seemed to do well with it. It was a miracle Danny somehow still owned the house, honestly. If Jesse and Danny could just sell the place, which was still worth an awful lot since it was on five acres of prime Santa Cruz mountain foothills, with some amount of surface water and a lot of grandfathered rights, then they'd both be able to get a fresh start. Danny wanted to retire down in Panama. He had a friend who could help him get a little sailboat to live on in one of the lesser marinas for a few thousand dollars a month. He just needed to sell the house. It had gotten away from him a bit, the maintenance and whatnot, but it had good bones. If Jesse could put a little elbow grease into it so they didn't get totally taken advantage of by developers, he wouldn't mind helping to set the kid up. Jesse wanted to be with Marisol. He was willing to move to Mars if he had to, even. He just wanted to prove to himself he didn't have to keep living in a hoarder house. It wasn't currently eligible to be purchased with federally backed loans because it wasn't considered habitable. Jesse had a list of improvements to make so they could sell the place on the open market. It would never be what it was when his mom was alive anyway. It was time for them both to move on. Jesse was more than ready for a distraction when his wrist buzzed. Marisol. She flipped the camera and started panning the room. The small living room was starting to take on the shape of her. Marisol's signature blue accents were peeking from open storage trunks on the floor. It appeared she'd bought some clothes, blankets, games, and lamps. Jessie realized she'd probably been planning for months how to allocate her small personal storage allowance on the rocket. The six months in Austin had undoubtedly helped her refine and pare the list. He hoped she had everything she needed. Look at this wall sample, isn't it incredible? Marisol was holding up a one millimeter thin plate of poly polystyrene in a marshmallow white, decorated with delicate blue scrolls in a pattern she called Old Blue Willow. It's so great here, Jess. Everything's new and clean. I just printed this on my in-unit printer. I peeled the old ones off the wall and recycled them. I'm going to get my porcelain design walls. Oh my god, do you remember how mad your mom was when I did that scroll work in my room? I mean, you'd think she'd appre appreciate the artistry of that type of fine work just done with a sharpie. Marisol's mother had been terrified that the Adkinsons would see the colorful patterns in the house and would kick them out. Yanaris needed the job badly. Marisol sounded a little odd as she finished the reminiscence. The rem reminiscence. There's a good chance I'll never repaint a room ever again. Everything on Mars, and I mean everything, is just manufactured on demand. Look at my kitchen. She panned over to the left, where there was a wall with a built-in counter and a few appliances. Jesse recognized the air fryer and range top, as well as another microwave-looking thing. I just printed a cinnamon roll. I'm going to get so fat here. Oh, oh, wait till you see this. You'll need to build one in the hills behind your house. It's marvelous. Mary walked across the living room to a set of double doors, flinging them open. Jesse could see they were in an artificially lit cave that was carved into the regolith. Rows of beds with vertical risers for plants, and ponds with goldfish in, in them below. Ran in parallel the entire width of the apartment. She was growing greens, potatoes, herbs, some legumes, and of course tomatoes. Jesse was thrilled to see Mary still got to exercise her green thumb. Okay, Jesse, I'll admit the bread isn't as good, but otherwise I promise your food I promise you food's not going to be an issue here. I can't wait until you're here. I've been working on Yanaris. She's worried about starting over at this point, but I don't think the Adkinsons are going to give her a raise. Adkinsons. There's no N in there. She's managing the entire property. All the grape drones and all the house manager stuff. It's an okay living, but she should get a chance to actually be the great winemaker she is, and she could do that here. The headquarters for Icon Homes is just down the street. Ha <laughs> or down the way, as they say here. It'll be a nice walk through the square. Or do you, th or you could take one of the shuttles. Did you apply for ATC yet? I think the deadline's in six weeks, right? I love you. We'll talk to you later. The thing about the Laboo's Meta Shield is that it was first generation. Lebeau? Lebeau? Lebeau. Uh, it was top of the line when they got it, and Danny still had money. 
Ah, yeah, welcome, everybody. We're uh, currently reading uh, chapter one of The Lore for Million on Mars. Uh, it was top of the line when they got it, when Danny still had money. He'd invested in an installation company with his high school friend, Charlie Allen. Jesse's family were the first on the block with a full dome, and it was a big one, over two acres, over the house and the downward-sloping front yard and garden and the upward slope of the backyard and its solar array that stretched all the way to the tree line towards the crest. Danny and Angie were so proud to let Jesse play underneath it with his friends. He remembered the cool, perfect air in the garden and the fussing, smiling moms. Some of the maintenance on the house was starting to slip, and Danny's scarves and rings and rock star boots were looking shabbier in the daylight these days, but the big, clean white bubble over all of it dressed it up. Now, though, going on 20 years later, it was showing its age. The house needed a new roof, which normally wouldn't be a big issue. In modern homes under the new Meta Shield, roofs were just decorative laminate on plywood, protected from the elements by the Meta Shield zone directly above it. First generation glitter domes didn't have zones, though, so in order to keep the house dry with a broken roof, Jesse set the shield to be fully closed when it rained. Therefore, the rain just ran off the entire dome in sheets. This meant the garden would go brown and that the solar array was blocked from the sunlight every time it rained. The solar was on a battery backup, but the batteries were also over 20 years old and drained quickly. The city had disconnected Danny from the power grid after his guerrilla efforts to tie in solar without a permit were rebuffed by the utility. The many unkept spools of wire around the rural power pole might have had something to do with the decision. So in the evenings after the sun went down, Danny and Jesse had about two hours of power until the batteries ran out. They relied on small battery-powered reading lights, the outdoor fire pit, and the propane gas grill outside. Danny told Jesse to think of it as an extended camping trip. During his first few weeks back, Jesse had rigged a makeshift water catchment system, a giant belt around the base of the dome which fed into drain pipes leading to a cistern at the lowest part of the yard. Totally illegal. All water from the rain was supposed to go into the earth to replenish the aquifers, but Jesse didn't have empathy this year for that particular bit of late-stage California thinking. Now that gasoline was not available in the area, he had thrown out the old generator and was using a primitive hand pump to get water from the cistern throughout the drip lines to the garden every day. Getting a new meta shield was totally out of the question. It would cost another 5G easily. This one was still functional, at least. Still, it was getting a bit frayed in the section covering the backyard from the total lack of cleaning or maintenance, and it could be cut down a bit so it didn't cover the solar array. That would get a bit more efficiency out of the old panels, plus generate some power during the rain, at the risk of exposing them to the elements and requiring a replacement faster. No matter, as new solar panels would be the next owner's problem. Sasha picked up on the first ring. Yo, man, you gonna cut up that huge glitter dome? I thought y'all loved that thing. Yeah, sadly. All good things must come to an end, especially in this house. I need to cut it and hem it. Online, I got as far as use a welding torch, and then I called you. Ha, okay. Well, don't hurt yourself. Hang on, and I'll send you a good vi intro video. Set up a call when you're going to start, and I'll keep an eye on you. Thanks. How are you doing? How are your mom and Travis? They're good. Thanks for asking. Getting ready for ATC. I got promoted to the Open Sea Demo Group, so it looks like I'll get to take the off-world mining job in, in the spring. I'm taking Mom, Grandma, and Travis. Grandma says it's all good as long as we get a house under the high part of the shield. That woman always had a taste for luxury. Well, I don't blame her. The thought of the shield being right above your head, a little t tear and the oxygen flows out, and icy dead air starts flowing in. Ugh, I hate all the good jobs are in totally uninhabitable place. Honestly, Jesse, you live in an unha uninhabitable place. It's totally fine on Mars, not much worse than an Alaskan winter, and getting greener every year. No rot, no sharks. At this, Jesse could hear someone in the background behind Sasha laughing uproarious uproariously. Sharks? Yeah, we had to move the Metis barrier down a couple blocks because we started demoing the Port Portofino Tower. Anyway, Carlos and I decided to get going early on Tuesday morning. You know, while the water was clear and calm, even though the shield wasn't quite up. I get down to the lobby level and start removing some facade, and the next thing I know I've got Carlos's fin in my face. A shark was swimming right out from behind the front desk down there, looking for the doorman. Carlos was back on the surface and was going to leave me down there to die. Miami's a dangerous place, man. 
Somehow, Sasha was laughing through the whole story. Nothing seemed to terrify him. As long as he was going to have a good story later, he was game for any adventure. He'd be an excellent... He'd be excellent at on-asteroid mining supervision. Jesse could absolutely imagine him suiting up to re reposition a drill that was stuck on a small rock hurtling through space. This was why he had an offer to do just that for a very large salary and with a relocation package to Mars that included a nice house for his entire family. All Jesse had to do was put a little money together for the ticket on the rocket, and he had a place to live and a job on the other side, and Marisol, who loved him, and he didn't even have to face sea monsters while doing underwater construction. He needed to commit to moving and applying to the Austin Training Center, ATC, today. Ad Astra Unlimited accepted applications on a rolling basis, but time was growing short. Even without a lot of work to do, making plans for a personal property, he'd be leaving. Oh, give me a minute, I guess. <laughs> Hello. Sorry for the delay. <clears throat> Quick, take over the stream. Streamer's gone. Nah, about uh, 20 pounds worth of meat just got delivered. <laughs> There's a local farm that I purchased from, and uh, usually, yeah, it's not usually on Fridays. Usually it drops off on Thursdays. But uh, they, they needed to take a day to get some extra stuff. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, okay, all right. Where did, we, where did we cut off? I mean, we were somewhere in here. We're, oh, we were so close to the end of an actual break anyway. <clears throat> oh, well, all right. Gonna have to do a lot of chopping things together on YouTube. <laughs> Do 
Jesse ate all the villagers? Is that what was going on? All right. <laughs> we'll keep going. Oh, you got you were all just making your own story in chat. <laughs> Jesse ate the villagers because he stubbed his toe. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, he needed to commit to moving and applying to the ATC. Uh, and time was growing short. Even without a lot of work to do, making plans for personal property he'd be leaving on Earth, he'd need at least three months on site for physical conditioning exams, adapting to the new diet, psychological exams, and clearing his final choices for personal belongings for transport on the rocket. Jesse was about to start in on the Meta Shield repair when he stubbed his toe on the edge of the billiards table. It was the last he could stand of the stupid thing. He shoveled the rest of the pile of books on top of it into the trash, not even bothering to flip through them at first. Then he stripped the felt with his bare hands and pulled big bricks of slate out from below that. Down to bare wood and big metal fasteners, he was momentarily stuck. Breathing heavily, hands on his hips, he scoured the area visually for ideas. Sawzall, that was an idea. There are few joys more pure than unconstrained demolition. As Jesse took the table down to pieces, a bit smaller than required, Danny poked his head out briefly in the late morning, grabbed a couple beers and a bag of chips, and wandered back into his bedroom. His last words, Sawzall, that's a plan. Jesse filled the big trash cans multiple times and finally filled the dumpster out front. He pulled a stepladder into the center of the room where the trash bag was taped to the pipe in the ceiling, and with a big rubber mallet, he knocked the entire apparatus out of the ceiling, leaving a square hole about two feet by two feet, totally open to the meta shield above. Jesse knew Danny was mad, so he left him alone in his room for a while. He was just going to have to accept that everything had to go. This was no way for humans to live. Jesse swept and mopped, and eventually stepped back and marveled at the big open room that he hadn't seen since the table appeared on the back of a flatbed truck with a drunken Danny and some characters that they never saw again. Danny paid them some cash, and the table came in and the wood stove had to be pushed out of the way in a hurry, leading to the emergency trash bag being put over the pipe as a temp uh, temporarily by his mother, who didn't want ashes to drop all over the green felt. Years later, in a joking mood, Danny pushed the billiard balls around the dirty table with his hands, as the cues had all broken or disappeared by then, and launched into a soliloquy about a billiards table about a billiards table in a residence always signifying regret. He was funny when he was tired. Jesse rummaged in the hall closet and pulled the old card table and two folding pulled out the old card table and two folding chairs. He set them up in the big space, causing noise to echo in new ways. He started the grill and threw on some sausages and onions, Danny's favorite. Finally, when the food was done, he went to call Danny to dinner. He hoped he'd be able to get him, get him over the demolition of the pool table tonight. What was he planning to do? Take it on a sailboat? At Danny's bedroom door, he knocked and called again. No answer. Finally, he opened the door and peeked in. Danny was dead. Massive coronary during his nap. It wasn't surprising, exactly. Jesse called the police, and they came to the house along with an ambulance. There were uniformed people throughout the house and in Danny's bedroom for a long time. While watching the adults take care of business, Jesse felt small again, as if all the chairs were too big for him, just like the decisions he now had to make. At some point, someone asked if he had any other family to call, and for some reason he thought of Aunt Colleen, so he called her. He also sent a message to Marisol, although he wasn't sure what he said, and by way of reply, Yanaris showed up from next door. Aunt Colleen arrived a bit later with an overnight bag, looking bewildered. She asked Jesse and a police officer if she could stay the night, and they both said yes. Jesse had cleaned up the guest room, which was also the laundry room, in his first week home. It was swept but still needed new bedding. Colleen waved him off and said she'd just pop the bedding in the washer. She remembered where it was. That surprised him, but then he remembered she used to come visit sometimes when his mom was alive. Just her, before she got married and had kids and moved to Fresno. She was younger than his mom, and he remembered her as the cool aunt. She looked just like his mom now. Finally, the police and the paramedics were gone, and so was his dad. Yanaris disappeared for a little while and came back with a hot dinner for Jesse and Colleen, and then went away. He wasn't hungry, so he lay down on his bed for a little while, but didn't really sleep. And after a while, he got back up and went to the kitchen for some coffee, as the sun was rising checking first to see if the coffee maker had enough power to turn on. 
Oh, good, there had been just enough light. Aunt Colleen was an early riser and very quiet. She looked just like she did last night, reasonably put together with light makeup. Jessie didn't trust her. Hey, kiddo, I'm glad you called me. I'm 23. But you were a kid last time I saw you. I miss you. I'm sorry you and my dad fell out. No, it's okay. Let's not talk about that. He just died. It's okay. I'm here to help. I've been worried about you. Worried about... Well... Colleen gestured around with her eyes. This irritated Jesse. He remembered how Danny was always annoyed at how prissy Colleen was. I've repaired all the significant damage around here, and I'm going to get to the cosmetics. Oh, you've done a great job. This is a lot for a kid to handle, though. We'll figure something out. Jesse flashed to anger faster than he wanted, and he attempted to deflect at the last minute by standing and marching towards his dad's bedroom. He shut the door behind him and realized he didn't want to be there. The entire room was disordered and distressing. He slowly took it all in, with his mixed feelings about his father, plus his new identity as an orphan, complicating his grief. The bathroom door was open, and the counter was covered with empty shampoo bottles, full ashtrays, partial tubes of toothpaste, and fast food wrappers. Clothes were strewn all over the place, along with, a stained bed along with stained bedding. He didn't dare look. The comforter slid on the floor. Dusty books piled on the floor next to the mattress. An open guitar case with a guitar inside missing strings. Heavy purple drapes closed. He could at least get some light in here. Danny had always preferred the dark, but that didn't matter now. Jesse pulled the heavy velvet curtains open, and a weak light sluiced through the overgrown pine trees outside through the meta shield that was pressed against the dirty glass. It was actually worse in the room with the light, as you could see how dusty it was. He stripped the bed and marched through the house to the washing machine. He tried to stuff the king-sized wad of comforter and sheets into the machine before giving up, and instead he marched back to the great room and grabbed a contractor-sized trash bag from the container in the kitchen. Back in the laundry guest room, he bagged all the dirty bedding and tied, up, tied off the top of the bag so he could throw it in the dumpster. Then Jesse marched back to his dad's room where he scooped up all the clothes on the floor into a hamper and a pile of mail that was open next to the bed up onto the mattress. Right on top there was a statement from New Freedom Mortgage. Jesse read the words reverse mortgage statement and a total balance that shocked him. They owed the bank three times what they'd get if they put the house on the market after Jesse made all the needed repairs. Jesse sat down on the mattress. He picked up his phone and looked for the contact information to verify the details, but he knew it was already he knew already that it was true. Danny had lied to him about what he owed on the house. They were never going to be able to sell it. Feeling lightheaded, Jesse allowed himself to consider the full ramifications of this information. He had spent every penny he had and all of his credit repairing the house which was still uninhabitable. Further, if he sold it for what it was worth, he'd still owe enough money to bankrupt him for the rest of his life. Jesse wasn't going to Mars. He couldn't afford it. Jesse felt oddly functional and light in those first few days after the realization. He was poor. Very, very poor. With few prospects for upward mobility. He was going to leave this house, its reverse mortgage, and its miserable belongings, and move into a printed house. He'd probably start out at the intake in Freedom, and then try to earn into a tech industry feeder in Tulsa or Boulder. Maybe it would be okay. He knew that Marisol would try and talk him out of his mood, and that Yanaris would try to talk her out of talking him out of it. He wasn't going to change his mind. Marisol had a bright future ahead of her, and he loved her and wanted that for her. But he had inherited the Labu family curse. He came close to greatness, to having Marisol and a life on Mars, but, a fate, but fate conspired to snatch it away from him. He would be brave. He would find a way to a better life. He'd be happy for Marisol. This would all be easier in January or February, after the next round of flights left for Mars. Then he'd have a guaranteed three-year gap before he could see Marisol again, and they'd both just have to adjust. Somehow there was a funeral for Danny, and it was at the same church where Angela's had been six years ago. Aunt Colleen must have arranged that. An odd assortment of characters filed past the casket. An honest representation of the company Danny had kept at the end of his life. It seemed to be mostly drinking buddies from the 007 Club. Maureen had a ferret, and Jay wore a feather boa and glass eye. Some of Jesse's friends came through, and that was comforting. Nicky and his mom, Maeve. They were dressed nicely and looked like they were trying not to notice anyone else. Then, though, Laura B. and Dave, it was as if six years had melted away. 
Even Colleen relaxed a little bit when hugging Dave tightly. Laura B. looked the same, just a bit thinner in the face like Jesse. Hey, I'm sorry. Well, I wouldn't say he didn't have it coming. Laura B. looked stunned, then smiled a wry smile like he used to. Dave grabbed Jesse by both shoulders and gave him a serious look. Missed you, kid. Laura B. piped up. Hey, remember how your dad used to tell your mom he would never get rid of that jacket, that he'd wear it to his grave? He was right. Jesse felt more at home than he had in years. Later, back home again, Colleen was packing and planning to leave the next day. She kept offering to help, but everything she touched felt like an indictment uh, in, indictment of how he lived. She was getting on his nerves. At least promise to come home for to my house for Thanksgiving, Jesse. You can't be alone. He nodded and assured her he would. Jesse, you don't have to go through all of this. You could just leave it for the hauler to sort. You could come with me tomorrow. Jesse was tired of her implying there was nothing of value in his home, nothing he'd feel sentimental about. He stormed into Danny's room, the one room he was pretty sure she wouldn't enter, and he started going through the jewelry boxes. There was a bottle of bourbon on the dresser. In a foul mood already, Jesse opened the bottle and took a long drink. He set it down and started playing his dad's last album on the speaker in the corner. He found his dad's class ring and wedding ring, along with one more ring he didn't immediately recognize with a grape leaf pattern. Oh yeah, this was the one his great-great-grandfather the jeweler had made during the gold rush. There was a diary in the jewelry box that Danny used to wave about when telling the story. Inside that front cover, the name Henry Labou was quite legible, but the rest was in French. Oh yeah, it'd be Labou, because it's French. <laughs> and Jesse couldn't make out a word. He remembered the story, though, after one more shot of bourbon. We've always had an adventurous streak, we Laboos, Je Danny would declare. We always think there might be something a little better over the next hill, next year. Henry Labou had come to the New World from his family home in France, propelled by frontier stories of gold and women to leave the cramped house and grim career prospects he'd been born into. He had decent skill, making gold jewelry with his father and his grandfather, and he expected the New World would have need for hundreds of him to build rings and brute approaches for the rich bankers, wives, and gold miners' mistresses. He landed in New York in 1872 on a steamship of such creaky presentation that he gratefully considered just staying in the growing city for a while. If he'd been able to find a job and a reliable bed in his first week, it's likely the entire Labou family in America would have been altered. But as it happened, the narrow streets of downtown Manhattan seemed contained seemingly no jewelers, jewelers in need of an apprentice at least none that spoke halting English in a French accent. And the boarding house was becoming prohibitively expensive at a bold dollar per night for its rat-infested semi-private rooms. In August of that year, Henry set out with a French prospector he met on the ship, who said he was heading south to New Jersey to join up with a wagon train heading west. Henry didn't know that it was late in the year to start such a voyage, that the journey was 2,000 miles, or that the or that reputable wagon trains required you to bring your own wagon and supplies. He just knew that out west meant gold. By the time they reached Chicago, Chicago, it's a remnant of... By the time they reached Chicago, Henry was more sophisticated about matters of travel to the frontier. He and the prospector parted ways, leaving Henry much lighter on supplies. Henry spent two cold winters and a full year in Chicago, working first as a bartender and later as a jeweler's apprentice, all the while saving money to continue west. Finally, by February 1874, he was able to buy a used wagon, stock it, and press on. The mountain pass to Deadwood just about did him in, though. He managed to continue until his last nerve nearly gave out, stopping for good in a small town named Rapid City. Winter was still in full force, so Henry set up, quickly set about getting shelter together for the remaining duration. Fortunately, there was a pub in town, so warmth, food, and company in the evening were easy to come by, as long as his money lasted. By ingratiating himself there quickly, he was able to learn about a cabin just outside of downtown that had been recently abandoned by a family that had decided to press on to California. No one seemed to care much if Henry took it on. With those two timely bits of luck and the small bag of coins he had left, he was able to just barely get through the long winter, rest a bit, and even regain a bit of weight. By spring 1875, though, Henry was starting to feel impatient. It had been nearly four years since he left home, and he was no closer to fortune. Word coming back from California was that the boom had busted. 
Henry set out on a hike one morning in May with a ham and cheese sandwich and a single jug of water. He was headed into the Black Hills, Indian territory, he knew. He'd also heard rumor of a big, fat, untapped vein of gold up there that the Indians were blocking access to. He just needed to get something going with his jewelry business, where he was going to have to find a job doing something back east again. By midday, he'd made it further into the trees than he knew was safe, but he hadn't seen any signs of gold. He hadn't found any water either, but he knew there were streams up here. The buffalo ran through, ran through for that reason. He walked a bit, or he walked towards a bright light for a while, realizing as he got close that it was a tall granite rock with a hole like the eye of a needle. He realized he was starting to hallucinate a bit from the heat. Walking on a bit longer, he found a ridge and a tall sloped rock he, uh, he scaled to get a view of the whole valley. Down below, he spotted a cropping of trees he thought must be over a watering hole. He stumbled down in the bright sun, finally getting to the trees and dry creek bed. He sat down under the shade canopy and gazed down at the dry stones, willing a small trickle of water to appear. He stared so hard he thought something he thought he saw something glinting in the sun. Crawling on his hands and knees, he approached the glint, or he thought he did. He might have hallucinated that. He recalled walking under the tree holding a grape-sized chunk of gold with cool water on his lips. Opening his eyes, he saw two native-looking men on horses. One was giving him a sip of water from a bladder on his belt. Stirred by a bit of hydration and suddenly fearing for his life, he shoved the rock in his hand into the other man's hand. To his surprise, the man spoke to him in French. Hello, my name's Louis. You seem to need assistance. No, keep this. This is not my path. I have to remember that all my actions will have consequences for ten generations. You Europeans should learn that. It's okay. We are of the Métis, or of the Metis. We know your people as well. Henry was unsettled by this exchange. All the way back to down all the way back to town on the back of Lewis's horse. He knew that he had been in the territory of Lakota, considered sacred, but he didn't think Lewis was Lakota. That business about ten generations, was that some kind of curse? Back in town, recovered from his ordeal, Henry noticed the gold he had was undoubtedly precious metal, but somehow adulterated. It had undulating bands of pink and green along with gold. Maybe there was also copper nearby? Henry formed a ring with a pattern he'd been dreaming about out in the hills. He carved a delicate grape leaf pattern based on a bunch of the juicy grapes he remembered from home. It was a beautiful ring, and he intended to hold this one for a bride. He was going to find that deposit and make his fortune. To start, though, he made two more rings from that small bit of metal, which he was able to sell to the shopkeeper and the barman downtown for their wives. And then he bought a bit more ore to keep making jewelry in his now signature grape leaf design. He went on to become locally famous for his Black Hills gold designs. But a rival jeweler ended up marrying into his family and stealing the fortune away. Henry himself never found the gold vein again. He never even tried, really. He hated being outdoors after that trip. He held on to his diary to pass down with that first ring hoping his son or grandson might someday follow in his footsteps using the map he'd drawn to reclaim the family fortune. Can you imagine? Danny's voice got high-pitched and he took another sip of whiskey. We've been cursed by the goddamn Lakota Sioux for ten generations. How do you like that? You know what cursed means? There's an ancient saying, Jess. Those whom the gods want to destroy, they first make promising. That's what it means. The same thing it always does. In our family, starting from Henry, we're all blessed with some kind of gift, some creativity or acumen, and we're good enough at it that we get a taste of some success. Every one of us. I mean, you know your grandma was a screw-up, but did you know she could dance? Oh, hell yeah. Heidi was a backup dancer for Lady Gaga, for Katy Perry, for Beyonce. All the hot stars back then. But she's a great example. Every Labu will find their gift and the gods will take it away. Poof. Thanks a lot, Henry, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Sorry, Jesse, I fucked you up here. Let's see. If Henry was generation one, then Amelia, great-granddad, granddad, then mom, then me, that makes six. You're the seventh generation. You and your great-grandkids all fucked. He finished the story that was that way every time with a wicked grin. Jesse hated it. I picked a good day to put the family-friendly tag on the Mars stream, hey? <laughs> Jesse woke up wary. Oh, God, oh, God. He didn't want to open his eyes. He knew the room would be spinning, and he'd very likely throw up. Where was he? Rumpled sheets felt too shiny to be his. 
Some kind of shaggy blanket that smelled like hippies. Right. Dad's room. Right. Dad is dead. He sat up in the grim darkness. A small sliver of grayish light sliced through the heavy drapery. Oh, not night yet. Oh god, he must have passed out. Wait, there it is. Later, Jesse sort of remembered vomiting all over the bed and then laying back down. And a little while later, Aunt Colleen came in. Come on now, Jesse, let's get you out of this room. Nothing good happens here. Come on. Jesse stumbled through the house, dark now, warm light flickering in the fireplace. Aunt Colleen's book was on the armchair in a pool of light from the reading lamp. Warm, homey smells. It was a cozy scene. He made his way into the room. It's cleaner in here, and towards the bathroom. He went straight to the shower, dropping his clothes on the floor. Everything smelled of artificial lemon and was too bright. Oh god, she cleaned. How long was he out? Aunt Colleen had cleaned everything. Every porcelain surface was gleaming. A vacuum had passed through. Had definitely passed through his room. Feeling more awake now, the headache was beginning to descend. The fan in the bathroom was screeching at just the right frequency to make his head throb. Jesse hurried with the hair washing and soap and got out, toweling off and snapping off the light and fan to return to blessed dark silence. He collapsed in his own bed, fresh sheets. This time he could tell he was drifting off. Oh god, he was going, finally going to get some sleep. A bit later when he woke, Jesse ambled a across the great room, trying to keep his balance. He held onto his belt buckle to steady himself, shading his eyes with his other hand and rubbing his temples with his thumbs. The overall effect was a lot like the town drunk stumbling out of an old west saloon. Aunt Colleen had the decency to keep scrolling through her celebrity gossip site without looking up, although the sound of her manicured nail flicking the screen took on a more pointed tone. She sipped ice water from a glass on a side table, and Jesse noted the way she pointedly returned it to the coaster she'd placed there. He recognized the ratty leather coaster. He'd begged his mother to buy the cheap coaster set when they stayed in a resort in Mexico, while Danny was on tour with his band for the last time. Jesse liked the way the frog with the sombrero was in a different pose on each coaster in the set, and he cajoled his mother into buying him the souvenir. He was five. He remembered the way she bit her bottom lip as she pressed the pesos from her beaded purse, or pulled the pesos from her beaded purse and then begged him to sit quietly in the lobby while she visited with Danny and the band for a bit before the show. He made the frogs dance, tracing them onto a piece of paper in a comic strip to give his mom when she came back. Colleen must have found them buried in the back of some closet. There was no way Danny held on to them. As he looked around, Jesse realized Colleen had really been doing a lot of work around the house to make it more, well, house-like. The curtains were open, and you could see through the windows again. The coffee table was clean, except for a stack of coasters. It was still weird to not see Danny's old engraved lighter sitting there. In the natural light, Jesse could see how dingy the walls were as well. Uh, uh, how dingy the walls were, as well as how stained and dirty the sofa was. Colleen must have been disgusted, but she kept trying to make it a little better. Chastened, chas, ch chastened, chastened, chastened. Jesse started to clear his throat to say something, but Colleen was still staring at her screen, pursing her lips a bit. To stall, he got a glass of water and leaned back against the counter while he drank it. Eyes on Colleen the whole time. After an awkward beat, he walked purposely across the room and out the back door to the patio. He made a point to only mostly close the door to show Colleen he was stepping out to do something, not storming off. Outside, a breeze had picked up, and the billowing sheet of the glitter dome made a snapping, flapping sound where it had ripped down near the ground. For or down near the ground, fortunately. Jesse walked around the side of the house and into the garage, quickly locating a rubber mallet in the big rolling toolbox. As he gripped the handle with his right hand, he realized the big grapevine ring was still on his finger, flopping dangerously over his knuckle. He made a mental note not to lose it, gripping the handle tighter to keep the ring in place. Returning to the patio, Jesse grabbed the billowing curtain with his free hand and expertly twisted and flipped the material until it started to glow and then pleat crisply into the even folds. This was one of the most useful skills Danny ever taught him, as it turned out, or Danny ever taught him, as it turned out. Years after investing in Charlie Allen's MetaShield company, Danny had done a brief stint as an installer. His career as a rocker was over, and there was a gold rush on for anyone who had skills working with Metis or could sell it to eager homeowners. Danny's old manager, Benny, thought it, he would be a natural at selling the stuff. He never seemed to have trouble negotiating anything with bored housewives home all day, but Danny wasn't disciplined and didn't like the hustle of sales. He liked installing, though, and as Jesse grew, he taught him how to spot the good stuff, like theirs. Plenty of additional material to use to patch dead spots. Pleated neatly and then pinned down 
along the ground line, and a silvery transparent sheen. Not like the starchy cheap stuff that ended up uh, that just ended at a clean hem at the ground line and required a lot of external electricity to maintain conductivity. Danny had bought a huge ream of the stuff when he was working for Charlie. He probably spent more on it, even with the employee discount and his own labor to install, than he ever made working for Charlie in the first place, just to prove he could afford it. Still, it was beautiful when it went in, and Angela had been so proud. Pride had always been his undoing. Jesse suspected he had inherited that. Look, Jesse, Jesse's mom had said, hiding under the big bed sheet or hide it, hiding under the big sheet before Danny pulled it over the top of the house. I'm a ghost, a haunted lady. She was smiling, and she and Danny were playful that day. She brought, she brought him cold beers while he hammered away, and in the late afternoon he serenaded them in old cowboy tunes, loud and unapologetically off-key. Jesse had grabbed a few galvanized nails and held them between his lips, locating the first missed the first missed rivet in the screen. He carefully lined it up with the foundation underneath and swung the hammer down pinning the fabric tightly to the frame. He continued down the line, flipping, folding, and hammering. He noticed in his peripheral vision that Colleen was peering at him through a nearby window. Good, he thought. Let her see how I take care of my house. As he got to the end of the sheet at the side of the house, he dropped the hammer so he could flip and fold a corner knot, one of the most advanced installer moves. He might have arranged himself for Colleen's maximum exposure to his folding skills. As he grabbed the screen with both hands, an electric shock in his fingers startled him, causing him to drop the whole curtain as he jumped back. Shaking it off in the air, he had the presence of mind to curl his fingers, preventing Danny's ring from flying off. Jesse stopped and looked at the ring. What? It looked like it had melted slightly, the entire grape vine and leaf pattern smearing to the right, and pooling up at the edge of his finger with the unmistakable hashing pattern of the screen itself molded into the gold. How is that possible? Metis only re reacts with Metis. That's the first thing everyone learns about. Gingerly, Jesse moved the ring closer to the screen. The billowy curtain started to shimmer silver near the point of contact with the ring, and he swore he saw the current move towards him, as though pulled by a magnet. The tip of the ring touched and started to melt again before Jesse pulled it quickly away. How is this even possible? The ring was from the 1870s. How could it be made of Metis? Jesse's first thought was that Danny had somehow bought the ring or stolen it, and had replaced the original heirloom ring with it. Then he thought about Danny and the level of strategic planning that would have required. No, the ring had been in the family in Jesse's memory since before Metis rings were available on Earth. The first Metis shield installations on Earth were in 2051, when Jesse was just six. But Metis jewelry, especially jewelry with substantial quality of the uh, quantity of the material, like this ring had, didn't start appearing as imports from Mars until much later in the decade. Jesse could remember Danny occasionally showing off that ring from the time he was in a high chair, so maybe as far back as 2047. He shot a quick video and sent it to Marisol, and on a whim, also sent it to Lorabee. Hey, it was really good to see you this week. I mean, it's been an awful week, but it almost felt normal for a minute, you know? Anyway, I wanted to show you something. Look at this. Remember that ring my dad wore sometimes? Maybe it's Metis. Anyway, let me know what you think. You know a lot about this stuff. Jesse took the ring off and put it back in his pocket before putting the welding mask on to start trimming the sheet of Metis. He cut the material in a line as straight as possible, then folded a seam around a heavy plastic cord and sewed it by hand with a thin wire thread, made a tiny amount of Metis and sold made with a tiny amount of Metis and sold by Bruhaha through the zipline network. He worked his way along the length of the glitter dome, cutting away excess material that extended over the solar field, hemming it and staking it down to the ground on the inside border of the solar panels. He made it almost halfway before his wrist rattled. Marisol. Jesse, that's amazing. I can't imagine what could possibly cause that. Is there any chance that the Metis was really hot? Melted it? I don't know. Seems like there's gotta be an explanation for this. How cool, though. If that's Metis, it's worth what? Six glitter? We could buy a homestead out by Lake Candor for that. A notification. Lorabee had called on video, and Jesse picked up. So, the weird thing is, how did he even get a ring made out of Metis in the first place? Lorabee skipped all greetings and got straight to the point. I mean, I just checked Wikipedia. There's only 200 artifacts made out of Metis on Earth, and they're all registered with the US government under ITAR. Only 73 of them are jewelry, and most are coins, which I guess could be melted into a ring. Still, they're registered and really valuable. No offense, but I don't see Danny coming across one of those things. Plus, the earliest Metis artifacts arrived in 2051, so if the ring's older than that, it must have come from a Metis deposit on Earth. 
Laura B., this ring was made during the gold rush in South Dakota. My great-great-great-grandfather Henry made it from a chunk of gold he pulled from a vein in the Black Hills, but he was never able to find the vein again. The legend's been in my family for generations. Or Henry found Metis, in which case he found a vein in the Black Hills. Jesse, what if there's a deposit of Metis on Earth? You could be so incredibly rich. Of course it will work out of course it will work out for you like that. Laura B smiled a kind of off kilter smile, but there was a bit of challenge in it. I'm sorry I've been a shit friend for years, Laura B. I miss you, and I appreciate you helping me with this thing. It's no problem. Uh you want me to look into it a bit more? Yeah, sure, I could stop by tomorrow. That's the chapter. Chapter one. Oh, we did pretty good. Right right to two hours today. More, more, more. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I do have other meetings and things to do today. But um, I will quickly do some giveaways. Because we can do those pretty quick. Uh... Yeah, thanks for hanging out and listening and tuning in. Of course, we'll throw it up on Price of Metis is One Dusk. <laughs> These early chapters have so much story build up and foreshadowing. Great read. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, custom giveaway. We're giving away a thousand fab XP. And one legendary Gen 2 greenhouse. Uh, so it'll be a very quick giveaway because got place to be and things to do. Custom. Start giveaway. All right. Exclamation mark raffle puts your name in the draw. You have one minute to get your name in. Uh, there we go. If you're new here, you do have to be following the channel in order to win the giveaways. Um, and yeah, we're giving away a bunch of fabrication experience and a Gen 2 greenhouse today. And of course, uh, these, if we're ever reading stuff on stream, actually anything we do on stream is always available on YouTube later. Uh, but particularly, I'll make sure that the Read through of chapter one is nicely uh, segmented out over on the YouTube, uh, so you can easily listen your way through it. For uh, yeah, for anyone who wants to tune into that later. All right, looks like we're pretty much done. We'll pick a winner today. So first person we're choosing here is going to be getting uh, fabrication experience, and that is going to Jeff. <laughs> okay, I think we'll actually give Jeff the. To a third role for chapter two for me, for anyone who wants to know how the story continues. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Uh, I think Jeff will actually give you the legendary greenhouse, because I don't think a thousand fab XP is uh, really probably what you're after. <laughs> that that fab XP is going to be a lot better for someone newer. Yeah, okay. We'll give Jeff... Jeff Jeff's going to take the greenhouse. Congratulations. All right. And I can track down Jeff's wax. We'll sort that out after. All right, next person. We're giving a thousand fabrication experience to Minsan Lucky. Congrats! Uh, you can connect with Morcox, and uh, he'll get you all sorted. I think you know how to find each other over on Discord. You'll be able to sort that out, right? Should be just fine. Yeah, a thousand fab XP is, I mean, that's not nothing. Uh, that's like, out of the early levels, I think that gets you all the way to five or ten, if you're at zero. Yeah, yeah, you can connect on Discord, you'll get it sorted. Okay, and we'll give chapter two, chapter two away to Call Me Trader. Congratulations. Call me trader. We'll get uh, chapter two sent your way. Just need you to drop your wax address in the chat. 1k fab XP is level five. Yeah. 
And at level five, you can start doing some of the ones, uh, some of the tasks that are a lot uh, better for experience as well. Perfect. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get that sent over. Make sure we get that sent your way. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, yeah, Jeff, you could drop yours as well. That's fine. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. If you're someone who's newer here and you're looking to learn a little bit about how things work on Mars, you're welcome to swing by the YouTube channel. And... Uh, yeah, swing by the YouTube channel. And if you're not already over on the Discord, definitely pop over, say hi, say hello. Great listening, now I don't have to read. Yeah, we'll make our way through some more in the future. Uh, make your way over to the Discord. Come hang out. Fantastic community, really friendly people. And uh, yeah, as always, it's it's been a pleasure. Every Friday is always a blast. Love hanging out with everybody and connecting with people. And uh, hope everyone has a wicked weekend. All right, later. <laughs>